Hello everybody, this is the Johnny Mayor, and welcome to a brand new Let's Play series. For this series, I'm going to be walking through, as you can see, Final Fantasy 3. This is the actual Final Fantasy 3, a remake of the Famicom original that originally did not come to the United States until the DS remake. It has since been remade on numerous platforms, including iOS, Android, the Ouya, if you happen to have that particular system, uh, and the system I'm currently playing on, which is the PSP. I'm sure you can find it on many other systems as well, including PC via Steam. So this is not Final Fantasy VI, which was called Final Fantasy III on the Super Nintendo. I have already done a walkthrough for that on my channel, so if you're interested in seeing that particular game, uh, please check for that series already completed. But for this particular series, I will be playing through this particular game. Uh, I do not promise it will be a quick series. Uh, this game is pretty long. It's going to take quite a while to complete. And with my current uh, schedule and free time being very, very, very uh, rare, uh, basically it's going to take me a long time to complete this series. But I do promise to get to it as often as I can uh, and try to complete the series in a timely fashion. Now, one unique thing about this particular game compared to some of the other remakes, uh, specifically the DS remake, is that you can actually get the original soundtrack from the Famicom version if you'd like to listen to the music in its 8-bit glory. I'm going to be using the rearranged version, though, for this particular playthrough. Uh, for this series, uh, for this particular Let's Play walkthrough series, I am going to be noting kind of all the differences between the different versions of the game, whether you are playing uh, the Famicom original, the fan-translated version of the NES version, which did never come to the United States, uh, or you're playing one of the remakes that started with the DS. I'll talk a little bit about kind of each of the different versions of the game, differences between them, and so on and so forth. But for now, let's get into the game. So in the Famicom version, you start off the game falling into a pit, and that is exactly how it starts off in the remakes. Now in the Famicom original, you actually start with four characters in your party, uh, and these four characters are unnamed Warriors of Light. In the remakes, they actually cut the party size down to just one character, and it's actually a named character. So we have our first character of our party here, who has fallen down through this hole, that opened up due to an earthquake. And you can name the character up to eight characters. I'm gonna stick with the default names for this particular walkthrough. So this character's name is Luneth, or Luneth, or Luneth, or however you wanna pronounce it. I'll be pronouncing it Luneth. So we're gonna walk around here automated in this particular cave, and we're gonna get into a battle. Our first of, of course, many to come in this traditional Japanese role-playing game. So like most Final Fantasies, we do have many of the options you would expect, like attack, uh, magic, as well as guard. Now, unlike some of the other Final Fantasies, this game does use a spell point system. I will get into more of that when we actually access magic later in the game. We can guard to cut physical attack power from enemies. We can change our equipment, depending on what equipment we have in our particular inventory at a given time. And so if you want to change out equipment, like change to a different weapon or change into shield and you have that in your item inventory, you can do so. You can switch between the front and back row and also you can run away from battle. Now we will just regular attack because that's pretty much all we can do at this point with Luneth. Now unique to this version of the game, at least probably many of the remakes after the DS version, you can actually do auto battle. So by pushing select on the PSP, we can activate an auto battle which repeats the action you previously did. It also speeds up combat significantly. So I'm going to be doing that for the most part, except in, you know, boss battles. So most of the normal encounters where I don't really have to worry about what my characters are doing, I'll be using the auto battle option. Now you'll notice as we walk around here that I'm defaulting to walking speed. If you go into the configure menu here off of our main menu, you of course have all the general things you would expect. You can access your equipment. You notice Luneth starts with a knife and also some body armor. You can access his statistics. He has strength, agility, vitality, intellect, and mind. All of those effects, statistics you would expect. Physical attack power, 
turns in, in battle. Uh, vitality is for HP that you gain at level up. Intellect is for black magic, and mind is, of course, for white magic in this game. You'll also notice I start off as a freelancer, and I have a job level. Now, in the original, you started off as an onion knight. Uh, that was changed in this game to freelancer. You can change your formation. Doesn't really matter too much, except back and front. In the back row, you will be able to take less damage from physical attacks, and we're going to change our default movement to run as well. Um, the problem with putting characters in the back row, though, is that they are less accurate with their physical attacks as well. So really, that's limited to magic uh, users uh, for your different party members. Now, we do not have access to the job system yet. We actually don't get access to it for quite a while. Uh, significantly longer in this version of the game. And we got a leather shield here, so I will stick that on. Then in the original. Um, so I will talk again about kind of how that differs and when we will actually open up the different jobs. And we're going to note here one of the unique things about the remake. Uh, it was kind of encouraged in the original to just sort of push the action button at various points that seem suspicious. In this game, you can actually zoom in and you'll find these glittering effects that will tell you that there is something unique going on, either an item or maybe a switch uh, that can open up a secret passage. So obviously this rock opens up a secret passage that allows us to continue. Now I will be cutting out, as in all of my series, um, any extra random battles that are with characters and enemies that I've already faced. I will show any random battles, though, with any enemies that I have not faced yet, and talk about any strategies maybe that are different for those particular enemies. So we're going to grab as many chests as we can in this area, which will be all of them. we got a long sword and now an Antarctic Wind. So an Antarctic Wind is an attack item, and we're going to be actually using that in a boss encounter that's coming up very soon. you also notice I have some potions as well as an extra knife that was left over when I equipped the longsword. So this is all pretty straightforward at this point. This is just kind of introducing you to the game, the combat, and kind of what to expect in this game. Now you'll notice compared to Final Fantasies 1 and 2, that the encounter rate is actually somewhat lower than those previous games as we take on some uh, new enemies here. So you won't be fighting as often, although in some of the dungeons the encounter rate does seem to go up pretty dramatically, and some of the later dungeons are very, very long. Now you actually cannot save in this game except on the world map, and so there are no in-dungeon save points. That de actually did not start until Final Fantasy IV. So some of these dungeons are pretty long specifically the final dungeon in the game is very long and that becomes kind of one of the infamous hindrances of the game that people don't like is that you have to do much of the dungeon without being able to save so if you die you have to redo all of that stuff that you had done previously the other kind of infamous thing about this game is that there are not phoenix downs that you can actually purchase so what I did is I did some grinding to get Luneth to his next level before we take on a boss encounter. He was pretty close. I only had to do two battles. But to finish that point, uh, you can find Phoenix Downs in this game, but they are not actually purchasable. Um, although you can actually get them as drops sometimes from rare enemies as well as a steel item from one particular enemy that I'll point out a little bit later. Other than that, uh, in order to revive characters that are killed in this game, you do have to use either the Life spell, the Arise spell, uh, Raise, whatever, um, or you have to use um, Life pools in the various towns of the game to revive your characters. So we walk into the Crystal Room here and we are attacked by evil. And so our first boss encounter, you can tell by the music, is with this Land Turtle. So to start with, we want to have our shield on as well as our weapon, and then we want to use our attack items of the Antarctic Winds. This will use a ice spell on the land turtle, which it is weak to. You know, this we take about four damage. Now that's because we do have the shield still equipped. Once we use both of our Antarctic Winds, we're going to switch to dual wielding weapons so that we do more physical damage. So we'll actually unequip the shield and instead swap it out for a knife. Now, I don't want to have that dual equip on initially because obviously I will take more damage while I'm using my attack items. So that saves me about 8 to 10 hit points worth of damage during the first part of the battle. 
So the land turtle only has a little over 100 hit points, so it should take only a few hits as it goes down. And that is our first boss encounter completed. Now you can try to save the Antarctic winds. They actually can be helpful against the second boss, but really it's not that difficult to fight the second boss. Ooh, and we got a Bacchus Cider. That's nice. Um, but essentially they're much more useful in this encounter. So I just encourage you to use them both. Use them, don't lose them, and uh, don't risk dying and having to start over the whole game because obviously we haven't been able to save so far. So we hear a mysterious voice, which is of course the crystal, very similar to Final Fantasy 1. This game is kind of a hybrid of the first two games. It includes some elements from Final Fantasy 1 and of course some elements from Final Fantasy 2. But it is much more of a traditional kind of experience point based system like Final Fantasy 1 as compared to Final Fantasy 2. The other big thing that it added to the Final Fantasy equation is that it added the job system. Now we do not have access to the jobs yet. Uh, after this encounter in the Famicom version you actually do access the jobs. You can be able to switch to the various of the first couple of jobs from the Wind Crystal here. But in this game, they actually make you do a few other things in order to access those jobs and be able to change your actual occupation, so to speak, or your class to determine what you do. The Wind Crystal is telling us we are the chosen one. It is our job to save the world from evil and we need to find some other people to help us out with that. Now, we started in the Famicom version with four people automatically. Those were the Heroes of Light or the Light Warriors, however you want to think about them. But in this game, we do have to find the other three party members. So they fleshed it out by naming all the characters as well as making you kind of encounter and find them within the first, you know, hour of the game. So Lunith and the others are our only hope, of course. These kiddos have to go out and save the world. So now we can actually save because we're on the world map, so I will do that, and then I'll meet you back here, and we'll head back into the cave. So it spits us out of the cave, and then we want to head back in because there's actually more items that we can find in here. So I can kill most enemies with just one weapon, so I'm going to re-equip the leather shield to protect myself, since I am kind of on my own here. We're going to head through an invisible wall here and pick up a leather cap, as well as some bronze bracers to augment Luneth's defense a little bit. And so now that we're upping his defense, he's much more survivable. And because of that, we can actually re-equip and dual wield to make us more physically imposing as well. So the last area we want to go to is just to the south here. There's a big room, and it actually includes the hole that Luneth stumbled into and fell through that led to the Wind Crystals kind of chamber. So we have quite a few different chests in here that give us some new things like another long sword. So now we can dual wield long swords for maximum physical attack power at this point in the game. As well as some more bronze bracers, the sleep spell, and a few other things. Now I mentioned that we start off as the freelancer class. Uh, the freelancer class is kind of very basic, very bare bones. Um, we can equip magic uh, up to level one spells of both black and white magic. And we can learn spells by either clicking on them in the item menu or using the learn menu in the magic system. You also can remove spells if you've previously equipped them and exchange them between characters. Other than that, freelancers, and there's the hole that we fell through, are fairly limited in what they can do. They don't have great stat growth, etc. So once we can change off of it, we will be doing that. Now we got a bronze knuckles, which is for the monk class we will get a little bit later. So I'll meet you outside. All right, so now that we grabbed all the items in the Altair cave, we're gonna head into our first town here, which is actually Lunat's hometown. We're gonna talk to the various citizens of town, and then we're gonna meet our second character in the game that will be joining our party, whose name is Ark. So in this game, again, you have normal experience, which you use to sort of increase your basic stats as well as your hit points and MP, but you also have job levels. So whenever you do actions in a battle, you will get particular experience towards either 
your regular experience or your job levels that you're currently using. And so Luneth is currently working on the freelancer ability, uh, the jobs for that particular class that he has. Um, as you increase job level, what it does is it basically makes you more efficient at using that job special abilities. Uh, some of the jobs do again have special abilities you can use like magic or the thief can steal uh, and so on and so forth. And so essentially you want to get the job level for a class that you're interested in using as high as possible because that's going to make you much better at using that particular class. Now with the freelancer it's not really important because again we're not going to really be using it. But if you do max out a class all the way to job level 99, there is a special item that you can get for that particular class that is typically a weapon, um, maybe an armor sometimes, I think most of them are weapons, uh, that is very uh, powerful and oftentimes will give you boost to your basic stats and something else like maybe protection from negative spells. But we're going to head to the northwest side of town and we're going to find our friend Ark, who's currently being bullied by some... Uh, some young kids that are significantly smaller than him, but also have very red faces. So they're talking about ghosts, and they claim that Ark is a coward. And Ark is another orphan raised in this particular town, um, but he is more into reading than adventuring across the world. So you might think, obviously, naturally, well, he's more of a magic character, which he can be. But in reality, it doesn't really matter. You have the freedom once the job system opens up to basically put each character into whatever job you want them to be in. So our appearance here sends all of the toughs away, but that doesn't really help out because Ark is uh, kind of ruminating on what they said to him. So he's going to run off and he's going to try to prove to us that he can do things on his own. And in my next episode, we're going to head after Ark, and we're going to see if we can help out a town nearby, which is having a particular problem. So as always, viewers, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you all next time. So long!